Sarvapi Shri Putram Patra Swarupam Rupam Sustained under Pushpanjali, my heart like flowers thousands and thousands of times at the lotus feet of my holy master, my supremely worshipable spiritual Gurudev, Asmadiya Parmarad Dhamma Guru Pada Padma, Nitya Lila Pravisht Om Vishnu Pada, Ashtodara Sri Rupa Nuga Charivarya, Sila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami. Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Param Gurudev and to Srila Prabhupada and to all of our Sri Rupanuga Gaudiya Guru Param. And finally, I offer my pranam to Oki Samu Vaishnavas and Vaishnavi. We have come to this path of bhakti. Why? To become Krishna conscious. Conscious of Sri Krishna. Sarva Bhutaishu Yapasyat Bhagavat Bhava Atmana Bhutani Bhagavat Tatman Isha Bhagavatotama. 
the Uttam Bhagavat, advanced devotee, sees in all living entities, Sri Krishna is there. And he sees all living entities are in Sri Krishna. He sees his own mood of love in everyone. And thinks, oh, I have no bhakti at all. Premara Svabhava Yaham Premara Svabhanga Say money, Krishna Mori Nahi Prema Ganga. When there's a real relationship of love, then that devotee feels, oh, I have no love at all, not even the slight fragrance of love from far away have I experienced. Or to speak of the Mahabhagavad devotee, even the yogi meditating on Paramatma. Krishna said in chapter 6 of Bhagavad Gita, Yo maam pasyati sarvatra sarvam chamai pasyati tasiham na pranasyami sachamena pranasyati for one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me. I am never lost to him and he is never lost to me. So this is, in the first case, Krishna consciousness. In the second verse, Paramatma consciousness. But anyway, we should have some awareness of the presence of Krishna everywhere. If we're not seeing that, then what? Krishna Surya Sama Maya Haya Andaka Yaham Krishna Tan Nahi Maya Adhika Krishna is like the sun and the Maya is like the darkness. <laughs> so whenever the sun is present, then darkness has no adhikar, has no jurisdiction there. So when our soul, when our heart is fully accepted, Oh Krishna, I am your Das. Amito Tomar, Tumito Amar, Kikaj Apanadani. Oh Krishna, I am yours, you are mine. What else is there to do? Hmm? Except for your service. When someone accepts this, they have turned towards Sri Krishna, then there's no Maya. Hmm? And conversely, if there's no Krishna, if you're not seeing Krishna, then where are you? Maya. Maya. Must be. There are only two things Krishna and Maya. You're not seeing Krishna? Then you're in a Maya. So. Supreme Lord is everywhere, but we don't see because our consciousness is contaminated. Kaivalyam satukam jnanam rajovai kampitam chayat prakritam tamasam jnanam manistam nirgunam smritam. See, Krishna told Uddhav, if your mind is in Saptagun, very high level of purity in Sattva Gun, not even transcendental, just Sattva Gun. Then Kaival Yam become Gyanam, you will have Gyan knowledge. You will discriminate between the body and the self, that is Gyan. And you see that everything is not a multiplicity of independent objects, but there is one Vastu, one supreme reality behind everything. You will be aware of that. Though one is not in Sattva Gun, really fully God conscious, but it is the door to that spiritual realization. It is like a window through which the Vishuddha Sattva can shine. So Sattva Gun does not impede the rays of Vishuddha Sattva coming into the heart. So it's not a full transcendental realization, but you have some awareness. I am not this body and the foundation of all existence is only one. So kaivalyam satyakam jnanam. But rajo vaikalpitam chayat. As soon as rajas is in the mind, then vikalpa comes, means bade. Everything is different. We have pritag drsha, the vision that everything is separate independent entities. And then we have no awareness of God, the substratum of all existence. Dharma Maha Prajita Kaita Votra Paramoni Matsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastavam Atravastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam 
the Srimad Bhagavatam kicks out all types of cheating religion, all types of materialistic, self-motivated dharma, selfish dharma. Hmm? It is understood by those who are paramoni matsaranam satam, completely free from envy. And what is known in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Vedyam Vastava Matravastu. Ve Vastava Vastu. The actual substance of reality is known. And when we know the actual substance of reality, then Shiva Dham, then auspiciousness is bestowed upon our life. Tapa Trayun Mulanam. And the threefold miseries, problems coming from the body and mind, problems coming from other living entities and problems coming from the demigods to what to cold earthquake tidal waves all these things threefold miseries is they are completely uprooted by knowing the vastava vastu the factual substance of reality hmm? but we don't see it we don't understand why rajo vai kalpitam chayat when rajas is in the mind and the mind is oscillating turbulent modifying Mm -hmm. so many chitta vrittis then <clears throat> we cannot uh, understand anything everything is reality is in we perceive it as being in a state of disintegration mm -hmm. uh, it is not all integrated uh, an integrated vision supreme lord is everywhere no disintegrated everything is separate everything is chaos everything is competing with it, others instead of the vision of harmony the vision of divine orchestration of the symphony of life so Rajas makes Vikalpa separate vision and Vikalpa is also means uh, types of imagination we'll come to that in more detail so then Prakritam Tamasam Jnanam thank you when there is a tamas, then you only know about prakriti, gross objects, the gross objects of the world, you know, like how to fix a car, how to bake a cake, or whatever. Just the, the knowledge of the techniques of manipulating the external gross material energy, which itself is a transformation of tamagun, tamas, or the objects of the world, earth made of earth, water, fire and ether are the transformation of ahankar in tamagun. So this knowledge is there, mm -hmm. then that person is not very philosophical. When a person is a little bit free from tamagun, but rajas is still in the mind, then they become very philosophical. But all speculation. Mm -hmm. You can study the history of philosophy, thousands and thousands of ideas, all wrong. <laughs> So Sri Jiva Goswami Pad, he's the greatest philosopher who ever lived. Many persons recognize him in that way. And he has explicated the answer to this all philosophical problems in Srimad Bhagavatam. And that's what we'll be discussing today. And then we'll see how that will um, segue into the glories of Lord Vaman Dev. Because today is Vaman the appearance day of Lord Vamandev and today is also the appearance day of Srila Jiva Goswami. Mm -hmm. So first, a little discussion about Vikalpa. Vikalpa is usually translated as imagination. Mm -hmm. But what it really means is this. In the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali he is given the definition because Vikalpa is one of the five functions of intelligence. In Srimad Bhagavatam the same five functions are described by Kapil Dev to Devahuti also. So Vikalpa means Shabda Gyan Anupati Vastu Shunyo Vikalpaha. Vikalpa is that vritti or that movement of intelligence, Buddhi. Vikalpa is a vritti of Buddhi which arises from Shabda from the use of words and beyond the conceptions that are associated with those words that we use and which is Vastu Sunya has 
no corresponding substance or reality in the external world. That is called Vikalpa. In other words, Vikalpa is a mental construction. It is a thought construction which has no correlated reality in the mind independent world. So perhaps a very succinct definition of Vikalpa would be a non-correlated thought construct. Understand? Our mind is always coming up with ideas. These are thought constructs. But the actual world is not like we think it is in our mind. Therefore, Vikalpa, or imagination in a general sense, is called <coughs> Vikalpa, a non-correlated thought construct. Is that clear? So, the commentators on the subject of Vikalpa have given many examples because it takes different forms. So, the, one of the most preliminary ones is uh, the classical example, Chitra's cow. So, there's a girl named Chitra and she has a cow. So, one day you're walking along and you see this cow and someone tells you, that's Chitra's cow. And now you have this thought construct in your mind. This is Chitra's cow. But this is Vikalpa. Why? Because if you examine that cow under a microscope, very thoroughly, every part of it, you will not find anything to do with Chitra. <laughs> <laughs> and if Chitra will die and take birth somewhere else, or sell the cow to someone else, that cow will remain unchanged. It's still the same cow. Understand? So, the concepts of possession are all Vikalpa. <laughs> Therefore, this is the first thing in Ushapanishad. Isha vasamidam sarvam. The entire universe belongs to God, not to you. Everything belongs to the Supreme Lord. Even your bank account. Even your body, even your soul belongs to the Supreme. So nothing is ours, nothing. But we are thinking, oh, this is, my, this is Chitra's cow and this is my cow. That's Chitra's body, this is my body. Hmm? So we have possessiveness over things. This is one example of the Kalpa, which is covering our consciousness and by which we live in a state of ignorance of the presence of Supreme Lord. We call it Chitraskar. Okay. Another example. Metaphors. A person may say, time flies. When you're having fun, time flies. But does time fly? <laughs> no, because time is not an object within space which, would, which can change location and go from here to there. So no, time doesn't fly. But we know what we mean when we tell someone time flies. It's a metaphor. So this is an example of a Vikalpa. Now, poets often use metaphors, and even transcendental poets use metaphors all the time. Right? Srimad Bhagavatam is full of beautiful poetry and metaphors. So there are two types of Vikalpa, Klista and Aklista. Vikalpa, that is the source of misery, and Vikalpa, which is the source of not the source of misery, klista and aklista. So, if your mind uses vikalpa in a positive way and in the service of Krishna, and you're aware that it is a metaphor, then it is not a, a cause of suffering. But if due to, to pramada, pramada, inattentiveness, you forget that your own thought constructions are only non-correlated thought constructions, <laughs> then they become klista, a source of suffering. So, another example of uh, Vikalpa. Shabda Gyan Anupati. That which comes out from the use of words and the conceptions related to that. So sometimes you can use words which don't have Akanksha. In Sanskrit, when you make a sentence, the words should have a kanksha, that means expectation. They should fill an expectation in order for meaning to be conveyed. 
So if I say the horns of a... So you have a country, you have expectation that I'll make, say, a cow or a bull or a goat. Eh? <laughs> but if I say the horns of a rabbit... Eh? <laughs> so horns of a rabbit is an exa example of vikalpa because there's no such thing, even though it's grammatically correct. The words are there and they're arranged grammatically correct, but it's a non-correlated thought construct, the horns of a rabbit. Another example is given um, flowers in the sky. Vase. <laughs> flowers in the vase, flowers in the garden. You expect, but flowers in the sky? No. Growing in the sky? No. So that's another example. Um, another example would be the son of a barren woman. Yeah. Nanda Maharaj. Maharaj. Huh? <laughs> so you expect to say the son of Nanda Maharaj? But if you say the son of a barren it makes no sense. So these are examples of Vikalpa, non-correlated thoughts, constructs coming from sound words and the concepts associated with them. Hmm? Then another type of non-correlated thought construct is negative qualities. Negative qualities. If, let's say, someone says that the body of a liberated soul, the spiritual body of a liberated soul, has the quality of being free from death. You know what I mean. You understand what I mean. Eh? Because the spiritual body will never die. So it exactly. has the quality of being free from death. But if you examine the body, there's no such thing as the quality of being free from death because the negative quality is just an abstraction. It's a non-correlated thought construct. So there are loads of non-correlated thoughts con constructs which fall in the category of, of negative qualities that we use all the time, like freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Equality. <laughs> These are all non-correlated th thought constructs. Free freedom means what? The absence of being restrained by something else. So that doesn't exist. It simply doesn't exist because everyone is restrained by something else all the time. We're restrained, we are limited by time, by space, by how much energy, by our weight, by our height, by the power of our senses and all of these things. We're conditioned at every moment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is why the attainment of mukti or impersonal liberation is considered to be like nothing. Less than nothing, like hell, kaival yam narakayate, because there's no chance of service in that state. But it's not gaining anything positive, just getting rid of something of the entanglement in material existence. So negative qualities are an abstraction, a type of vikalpa as well. And uh, all different kinds of abstractions as well. So you see in philosophy, philosophers are always abstracting from the totality on purnam madaha, the, the world, the reality is complete, but they're always abstracting by vikalpa and trying to come up with some ideas, only speculation. Hmm? Here's another type of vikalpa. The body of a Brahmin. Have you ever seen the body of a Brahmin? Yeah? But who's, who's got one of these? Oh, there you go, there's the body of a Brahmin. Yeah? Have you seen the body of a Brahmin? Yes. I think so. No. No. Okay. Why? Because the soul, the soul is, the, is, you could say, the owner of the body. So first of all, the soul is not the owner of the body. Hmm? Because who is the Brahmin? The Brahmin is not dead. If he's alive, then you're talking about the soul. Right? But the soul doesn't own the body. That's the first thing. And if you were to, just for argument's sake, say, well, the body that is associated with that soul, then the soul is not a Brahmin. Na ham vi pro na cha na rapati na pivaisha na sudro. The soul isn't a Brahmin. Then what's the Brahmin? The Brahmin is the body. So there can be no such thing as the body of a Brahmin because the Brahmin is the body. And the soul, whose body it is, isn't a Brahmin. Because... I'm not a Brahmin, not a Kaptriya Vaishya Sudha, or anything like that. So a word like, the bo a phrase such as the body of the Brahmin is Vikalpa, it doesn't, doesn't exist. Because the Brahmin actually is the body. So Vikalpa makes us do two things. It makes us see difference where there's oneness. But also 
makes us see oneness where there is difference. Hmm? So when we say the body of the Brahmin, actually we think there are two things, the Brahmin and the body, but there isn't. Hmm? Because the body is the Brahmin. Hmm? So that's what we do when we say the holy name of Krishna. We do exactly the same thing. Understand? The holy name of Krishna. We say it, and by Vikalpa, it's the name of Krishna. But actually, we have taken something that is one and made it into two, like saying the body of the Brahman. The body of the Brahman is the Brahman. So the name of Krishna is Krishna. Yes. So in this way, our mind, due to Rajagun, is filled with Vikalpas only. Oh, Vikalpa, Vikalpa, Vikalpa. Comes from Rajagun, and Rajagun is, you know, Maya has two vrittis, the Vidya Vritti and Avidya Vritti. Sattvagun is the Vidya Vritti, it gives Gyan, knowledge. Kaivalyam, Satvitakam, Gyanam. Then, Rajagun is called the Avidya Vritti, the ignorance, uh, the, sorry, the, yeah, Avidya, the opposite of knowledge. The nescience potency of Maya, that is Rajagun. So, if we are not seeing Krishna, not aware of Krishna in everything, then we are in Maya. If we are, feel ownership over any, every, anything, including our own body, we are in Maya. Hmm? And not only that, don't think that you are not the only, that you are not the body. But even the body, is not the body. What you think it is, is also wrong. First know that you're not the body, then later you will understand that even the body is something else. Not what you think it is. And that's what we're going to discuss today. Yes, that's okay. This is the verse. You can look. Chapter 15. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7. <coughs> this uh, chapter is entitled Instructions for civilized human beings. <laughs> <laughs> so you're all very civilized human beings, so we'll discuss this chapter today. <laughs> uh, so here, Narad Muni is speaking to Yudhisthira Maharaj, and he's about to make a total deconstruction of the bodily conception of life. So be careful. If you want to hold on to the bodily conception of life, now is your chance. Please leave. <laughs> <laughs> when we come into Sadhu Sangha, the association of Vaishnava and Guru, we should not think, oh, I am going there, I'll listen to some entertaining discussions and then go home and be <laughs> the same person who went there. No. Not allowed. <laughs> That is not the way to approach the uh, Vaishnava Association. One should come in the spirit of surrender and hear deeply. And by hearing the transcendental message, then what will happen? All the vikalpa, all the misconceptions, bodily identification, it will all be washed away. If we are hearing deeply, Submissively, with a great honor. So, Nagrishi is saying, we can chant the verse. You can repeat after me. Abadito piyabhaso Abadito piyabhaso Yatavastu tayasmitaha Yatavastu tayasmitaha Durgatattva daindriyakam Durgatattva daindriyakam Tadvat arta vikalpitam Tadvat arta vikalpitam So what it means is yata You can see in the second. Yata, just as a person sees abhas. Abhas means a reflection. But he thinks that that reflection in his mind, smritaha, due to uh, bala buddhi, due to childish intelligence, 
he thinks the reflection is a vastu, an independent, self-existent substance. Even though abhadito, hmm, abhadito means it is tarka virod, even though it is tarka virod, completely against all reason, to see a reflection as being a self-existent, independent substance. But due to childish intelligence still, a child may see like that. For example, there's a wall and a light is shining, someone is moving a light or a laser or something, and the spot is on the wall, and the child is looking and trying to catch it. Because he thinks that that reflection on the wall is independent, he doesn't understand that it's a fully dependent on a real substance. So, in the same way, Andriyakam means the objects of the senses around us. Everything that we see around us is just like that. Artavikalpitam, but we are thinking that the things around us are self-existent. Independent self-existent entities. Durgatatwad, even though rationally we cannot establish that idea. But why do we have that idea? Vikalpitam. It is our non-correlated thought construct. Hmm? I've just done the translation, made the translation of the verse. It may not be fully clear, so let's just consider the implications a little bit more. Hmm? When you are walking around in daily life, you see all the things around you, a tree, a car, your house, your body even, and all these things are just, they're just there, right? They're just sitting there by themselves. There's no one behind them, right? Causing them to be present at every moment by his Shakti. It's just, they're just like there. But really, at every moment, everything in existence is only manifested by the Supreme Lord Himself. It is exactly like music. You're listening to music, but the music is only there because the musician is playing. And the moment he stops, it's gone. So in the same way, the creation is the music of Paramatma. And if any, if Paramatma were not there manifesting uh, in the form of all things, then there would not be any things at all. Just right now, if he stopped, then that would be the pralaya. The entire universe is, disappears into the, back into the potential energy of pradhan. Mm -hmm. So this is why it is said in Vedanta Sutra, Vyapate show bhaktastat bhava bhavitvat Every word in the dictionary is the name of God. Because all words denote things. And all things, Eko Bahusham, the one Supreme Lord, has become many. So the, all words are primarily the names of God. And secondarily, they refer to the things that you think in your mind are separate. So, this is Vikalpa. Our perception works in this way. Kumario Bhatta, in his Shloka Vartika, he has said, Hasti Yalochanam Gyanam Pratamam Ne Vikalpa Kam Bala Mukadi Vigyana Sadrishtam Shudavastujam. Whenever we, there are two types of perception. First is called Nirvikalpa Pratyaksha and then Savikalpa Pratyaksha. The first perception is without Vikalpa. In other words, as soon as you look at something, it's just that substance there. For a moment, the uninterpreted experience, Balamukadi, Vigyana, like the realization of a newborn baby or a deaf and dumb mute who has not become involved in the world of words and concepts. So just like a newborn baby is just seeing, but not interpreting anything. Huh? 
So our initial experience of everything is like that. But in less than a millisecond, our buddhi moves and begins to conceptualize what it is. And says, it is a tree, it is an apple, it is a human being, it is my body, like this. So this is vikalpa, the movement of the buddhi identifying everything in this way. But it's not identifying what it actually is, what the actual vastu is. In this way, anyone who is in maya, anyone who has a touch of rajas in their consciousness, they're walking around and they have this experience of, well, where's God? Maybe he's in heaven somewhere. When actually he's everywhere. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Bahunam Janmanam Ante Jnanavam Mam Prapadyate Vasu Deva Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudurlabaha So, it's not that the presence of God suddenly appears to the devotee. That's the reality. It is us, it is we who are walking around covered by the vikalpas of our own mind, projecting onto the world non-correlated thought constructs that everything is separate. Hmm? Arjun saw it. In the Bhagavad Gita, he was so worried about what will happen. Oh, Allah, Allah. <laughs> he dropped his bow, I'm not fighting, he sat down. He was all dejected. That's the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita called Vishad Yoga. means the yoga of dejection. So sometimes getting depressed in life is like an impetus because it makes us do some soul searching. Ah, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? So first chapter is that, that soul searching that, brought, that was brought about by the depression of being in Catch-22, which whichever way, whatever I do, it, it will all turn out bad. Yeah. That's, but then what happened? By chapter 11, then Krishna showed the universal form, past and the present and the future also. And then Arjun realized, he became free from Vikalpa. Krishna, you're everything, there's no problem. <laughs> You yourself are all the warriors on both sides. There aren't two sides. Hmm? So people in, in the material, they, they're always dissatisfied because of rajas in the mind. So the way they're thinking, the grass is always greener on the other side. But when the mind is free from duality, then there are no sides. Hmm? Only awareness. Krishna Consciousness. So, first of all, here Narad Rishi is saying that just as a reflection has no independent existence, but it is the your vision, you think it's independent, because you are not conscious of the actual substance, which is behind the reflection, due to childish intelligence, Balabuti. So in the same way, all the things that we see around us are the abbas, the reflection of the spiritual world. Hmm? And they are not independent objects, but they only exist because the Supreme Lord exists. In fact, He is the one Vastu, which is behind everything. So there are, there are not a multiplicity of self-existent independent objects. There is only one Vastu. This, we told him, did anyone hear the, yoga, the class in the yoga studio a few days ago in Miami? The Hanksa avatar said, you are the witness of the states of waking, dreaming and deep sleep. That's what you are. And who am I? Everything else. <laughs> Hanksa avatar. Hear it deeply. When you listen, then your eyes become open for a moment. But you have to, you can't after the class close them and walk out. <laughs> Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Salakaya Chakashura Vinitandena Asmai Sri Gurave Namaha I give pranam to Gurudev. Why? Because he opens my eyes hmm? with the torch of knowledge. Hmm? So don't, when your eyes are open, don't go back to sleep. <laughs> so now, in this verse, very beautiful point, Nadrish is saying, the Aindriya Kam, the objects that you see around you, 
Durga Tattvad, you cannot logically explain how these objects are just there and existing by themselves. You cannot. So many philosophers have tried to explain the world separately from God, without any awareness of God. But all of the explanations fail. So then in the next verse, you can go to the next line. Nad Rishi is now breaking down the speculations of all the philosophers who ever existed and refuting them in one verse. Uh, this is one of the most amazing verses in Srimad Bhagavatam for for Tatvadhyam. Not for Rasa. But <laughs> to start somewhere. So you can repeat after me. Kshityadinam Hihatanam Kshityadinam Hihatanam Chayana Katamapihi Shitti means earth. Adinam, etc. So earth, water, fire, air, ether. The in the elements of the world. Hihatanam. Which are there in the objects that we are seeing. Chayana katamapihi. Here, chaya means the represented the representation of that object in your mind. In other words, the objects of the world are there, but you don't see them directly. Your chitta modifies and makes a model of them, and your your soul is seeing that. So everyone is seeing the world through the filter of their own mind. So everyone's mind has is experiencing the, their mental representation of the object in the real world. Distinguish. Huh? Don't think that everything you're looking, you're seeing the thing. It is exactly like a camera. When you point a camera at something, then the screen transforms and makes an image of what's in front of the lens. So in the same way, when your eye is pointed towards something, then your chitta transforms and makes a mental image of the object and your soul is seeing that. Right? So it's like, there's your eye and there's your chitta. Like that. There's a guy, right? Okay? So, everything you're experiencing, make the distinction between the objective reality and the representation of the object in your own mind. So here in this discussion, that is called chaya. Chaya means like a shadow or, or a bath. But here specifically, here, the mental representation of an object in your own mind. Katamapihi. This representation that you're seeing is not na sangato vikaropi na pritandam nishom risha. It is not a sangat. A sangat means an aggregation of the elements. In other words, the elements, either from the Sankhya conception, or from the the elements from the Vaisheshi conception, or the, that is the atomic idea, everything is made of atoms, hmm? or in Nyaya as well, they think everything is made of atoms. And today, the scientists think everything is made of atoms. Hmm? So, the objects that we're seeing are not a Sangat, just an aggregate of atoms, which are not connected or compounded with each other. It's just a collection. I give an example. When you look in the distance and you see a forest, right? And you say, here is a forest. So actually this forest is a vikalpa. Because when you get there, you won't see any such thing as a forest. You'll just see a tree here and a tree there and a tree there and a tree there. Why? Because the, the word forest is a collective noun that you give to an aggregate of trees. But it's not really a whole thing. Hmm? You have just put them all together in your mind and made there's a whole thing called this forest. Hmm? But the truth of the matter, it's an aggregate because they're all standing there. And the proof of it is, if you grab one of the trees and uproot it and carry it away, the whole forest doesn't move. <laughs> right? You just get a tree, take it, I and mean, don't do that. But if you were to do it, <laughs> we love trees, so we don't do that. So, but if you were to do that, the forest would stay right there, the forest. Right? What? Because it's actually just an aggregate of individual trees. So Buddhists say like this. They say really, part man, 
tree. These are all words, just words. You're in your mind, you're projecting that. It's just aggregates of atoms. And so nothing has meaning. Everything is shunya, devoid of meaning. You see? So, but here at Nardrishi is saying, no, 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 don't think like that. You cannot say that the objects are just an aggregate. Why? Because if I catch your finger and pull your finger, your whole body will come. It's not like I just pull your finger and just detaches like that. <sighs> so, the forms that we see around us, they're not just aggregates and we're projecting a sense of wholeness on them. They really are whole in some way. Hmm? So how is that? There are different ways. So he's saying first he's rejecting. Don't think that the wholeness of things is just a, a, an imagination because everything is just a sangat. That's been rejected. It's not just an aggregate. Things are really, have holes and parts are there. If you take a part and pull, the whole will come. Uh -huh. Like if you, you only pull one part of the tree, but the whole tree is coming. So, the, the concept of Sangat has been rejected. Then Vikara OP. Vikara means the world is not a compound of the elements. So scientists think more in this sense, that the elements combine together and then they make compounds, which is a new substance arising from the compound of the two other substances. So that's called a Vikara. And Vikara OP, here Api means a transformation. So in Sankhya, they think that the elements transform while remaining separate. So one element it transforms and takes, upon, takes on another shape. So in this case, whether it's a, a compound or whether it's a transformation of the elements, then there's no difference between the whole and the part. There's no difference, right? Because the whole is just a transformation of the parts. The, parts have tra the various elements have transformed and they've become the whole. So there's no difference. Uh, between the whole and the parts. So then the question comes in the next line. Na pritan nan vitam brisha. Actually philosophers for thousands of years have been speculating and trying to answer this. It's called the problem of universals. Hmm? The, the, the wholeness of something and its parts. What is the relationship? Is it just in your mind or is it is it real? So here, if we take an object to be the same as its parts, then Nardrish is saying, Na Pritan. We cannot say that this whole is existing separately from its parts, and we cannot say that it's, ex it's one with the parts either, if there is such a thing as a whole. Remember? With a Sangat, there's no such thing as a whole, you just imagined it. But the Sangat has been rejected because you cannot, you take a part and the whole thing moves. So there's some way in which holes seem to exist. So now what's the relationship between the whole and the parts? Is the whole one with the parts or does it exist separately? For example, in a cloth, the cloth is made of mm, the thread. So is the thread in the cloth, or is the cloth in the thread? Hmm? <laughs> Some cloth right here. Is the thread in the cloth or not? Yes. Yeah, the thread is in the cloth. Cool. So I'll just take out the threads, and the cloth will be, still be there, and I'll put them back. If the threads were in the cloth, this is your vikalpa. You're thinking this, ho this whole thing, in your mind you have a chaya, a representation of this whole thing called the cloth. And the threads are in it. That's, that means that I could take the threads out and the cloth would still be there and I can put them back again. Because the threads are in the cloth, remember? Right? You see how Vikalpa works? Our own mind is creating non-correlated thought constructs all the time. We don't even notice. So in Nyai, they would say, no, no, the, the, the threads are not in the cloth. The cloth is in the threads. In other words, the jati, the universal, the characteristic of clothness, is, uh, is inherent in the threads by Samavai Sambandha. So, 
Yes, so na pritan, we cannot say the cloth is separate from the threads, that the whole is different from the parts, because if you take away the parts, the whole doesn't exist. So now we're left with one more option, that the whole and the parts are the same. Mm -hmm. So then, now Rishi is saying, nan vitom risha, na anvito, that we cannot say that the parts and the whole are the same. Why? Because then the question will have to come that this whole exists and it is pervading the parts. Now does the whole pervade each of the parts fully or does the whole exist partially in each of the parts? <laughs> yeah, right? You're considering these two things. You have this idea in your mind that there's a whole object here. Mm -hmm. Now this wholeness, does it reside in every one of the parts or does it reside partially in the parts mm. now if you say that the whole resides in every part fully now you have a problem because the finger would be the same as the whole body mm -hmm. yeah. right which it obviously isn't so that's wrong and now we're left with one thing and that is that the whole resides partially within the parts. Now, the, this conception of the whole is whole because it's not, a conception, it's not a collection of parts. So if the whole were a collection of parts, then each part of the whole could exist in the constituent parts of the object. However, because the whole, mm -hmm, if you say that the whole is made of parts, then there's no such thing as the whole and it vanishes completely. And if you propose that the whole does exist, in order for the whole to partially exist in its constituent parts, it would have to also have a set of non-constituent parts with which it could pervade the constituent parts. Uh, uh, huh? Do you follow? It's a little bit... <laughs> huh? I just said one more time. I can see who catched it. Quote the idea. Right? You, you have an idea in your mind. What am I trying to do here? We are trying to remove Vigalpa. Not me, Narad Moon is doing it. But anyway, through me. <laughs> We're trying to remove Vigalpa. We think of things in terms of being whole. That's why you said the thread is, is in the cloth. It's not true. But it's simply not true. So we think of things as a whole, and there are parts as well. So if we've established that they're not different, then we're left with, well, there must be one. So how is the whole present in the parts? It can be fully present in each part, we've rejected it. Then it, the whole has to be in parts, pr partially present in the parts. But then the constituent parts are parts. And this is also just parts, so you have no whole. So then you realize that the idea of a whole was a vikalpa. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to main... Is that clear? That's yeah, clear. Yeah. And now we'll just go, now that's clear to you, we'll just go, look, this is a little bit unnecessary, but just for, for completeness, Jiva Goswami part says, look, but if you would say that the whole can somehow pervade the parts um, partially, and the whole doesn't exist, doesn't disappear, because you didn't recognize it as a vikalpa, then this whole would have to have a set of non-constituent parts in which to reside in the constituent parts. But then the question comes, well, what's the relationship between the non-constituent parts and the whole? How, <laughs> how are they parts? Does it reside in them? Well, then it could, but it would require another set of non-constituent parts, which would require another set of non-constituent And then you have, you know? Eternity. Yeah, ad infinitum. Absurd, it becomes absurd because there's an infinite regression. So that has been rejected. So. Narad Muni says, Mrisha. Mrisha means false. False. That is, your entire idea of the validity of self-independent wholes is just a vikalpa, a creation of your mind. And you have to apply this to your body. Here, chaya means the representation in your mind of a self-existent whole. And it especially refers to, in the context of the discussion, the bodily conception of life. Okay, I'm just pulling the rug from under your feet. <laughs> right now. If you're hearing carefully, 
the rug of your whole world should have just been pulled. <laughs> <laughs> and your Atma is now floating in the ocean of truth. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So the body itself is not a self-existent whole. But we are imagining that it is by Vikalka. Now, the problem is, if you say that, well, okay, I reject the idea in the next verse, Narad Muni says, gives an answer to this. Okay, I reject the idea that there's no such thing as holes. They're only parts. Hmm? They're only the elemental parts. There's no such thing as a whole. But the problem is that a part is a whole relative to itself. Uh -huh. Right? So if you've got something, you cut it up into parts, right? So they're the parts of something. But if you just take and you say, no, no, I don't believe in the whole, I only believe in the part. And that's but the part thing. is now yeah. a whole relative to itself, consisting of parts. Yeah. <laughs> so you just made another vikalpa. Right? So first of all, we identified that the whole doesn't exist. That was a vikalpa. And now we've demonstrated that the parts don't exist either. That was another vikalpa. Because an individual part is a whole relative to itself. So then why on earth are we seeing all these individual self-existent entities around us? So now, now Rishi is saying something very beautiful. Let's just examine the body a little bit more. Have you ever put your foot in the local river here? Yeah? Have you ever put your foot in any river? Yes. Right. <laughs> Have you ever put your foot in that same river twice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we think that we have. On different occasions. Huh? <laughs> Even when a uh, Greek philosopher also he said, man can never put his foot in the same river twice. So Krishna has said this also in Srimad Bhagavatam. You cannot enter the same river twice. In fact, the very idea that it's the same river is wrong. Because there's a collection of water, which is in a constant flux flowing from here to there. And in your mind, you have given a name to this, wa this water and said it's a whole thing and called it a river. And you give it a name. Of course, the goddess of the river is another thing. <laughs> right? So the goddess Yamuna is another thing. But when a, when a river is flowing, it's just water. And every time you put in your, your foot in it, it's a different water. Right? How long do you think that you could look at a flame? You've seen the flame of a candle. Right? It's like a tear shape. Right. Illuminating. How long do you think you can look at a flame? Until it burns out. Uh, Until it burns out. Yeah. Right. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because it's never the same flame. <laughs> at every single moment, there's a combustion going on on a molecular level. <laughs> like this, it's always different. But by imperfect senses, you are projecting that this is the same flame. Hmm? It's the same thing. So in the same way, you are thinking, first of all, you're thinking that your body is a self-existent, independent whole. And secondly, you're thinking it's the same body. Oh yeah. And it never is. Huh? The idea that it's a self-existent, independent whole is a, is a vikalpa to begin with. And that it's the, whatever it is, that it's the same one <laughs> at any moment is also a vikalpa, an imagination. You see how Narad Muni is totally deconstructing. Hmm? And the idea that it's yours is also a vikalpa, like Chitra's cow. Huh? Huh? Is, it, is it starting to sink in like what Maya means? Yes. <laughs> not Maya. Maya means. Yeah? Like you think, oh, today I'm not in Maya. <laughs> because I woke up, put on tea, like chanting my rounds. <laughs> but if you just have the bodily conception of life, it's already Maya. If you don't see Krishna everywhere, manifesting all things at every moment, it's Maya. It's all Maya. So, now another thing. 
the followers of Nyaya and Vaisheshik say the world is made of atoms. But Srimad Bhagavatam says that actually atom, the idea of atom is also vikalpa. There's no, it's, it's a creation of the mind. Why is that? Because the Vedic atom is actually an uh, anu means that which is indivisible. In other words, if you divide something down, 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 you come to the last part, but this last part is indivisible. It cannot be divided. Hmm? It doesn't have any parts. So that's called anu. Anu. So in Bhagavatam, see Krishna says, <clears throat> Vikara kyayamano pi pratyag antaram atmanam and prakyad atmanam antara. Nani rupyos tenorapi satsat sittama atmavat that even though all objects are the transformation of the elements earth, water, fire and air and ether but we cannot say that these elements at the base of them there is the atom because nothing can be explained without reference to the paramatma not even an atom because were an atom to exist it would be Paramatma himself, it would be God and completely conscious. Now that's not what I've said, it may not be immediately apparent to you. But the basic breakdown is this, that you see the forms around you of all things. And the reason these things have forms is because they're a collection of parts. That can be, things can be, that's why things in this world are temporary, because the parts that constitute them come apart. The, the, the atoms in the body of, an, of, of, a, of a creature, he dies and it all falls apart and goes into the earth. Then he becomes food and then someone else sees he becomes their body and then they die and everything comes apart. So because the mature objects are divisible, so they're temporary. But something which is indivisible cannot be temporary because it has no parts to come apart. And because the shape of something it, it arises from it's the collection of its parts together it can be explained by that but that which has no parts its form cannot be explained in terms of the aggregate of its parts so the only explanation for the form of a partless that means in philosophy that's called a simplex in Sanskrit we say akanda huh? unbroken advaita there's no duality in it it's akanda acheda indivisible. So the atom in, in philosophy, in Vedic philosophy, is, is acheda, akanda, abe, it's indivisible, cannot be separated. But if something existed which actually has no parts, what would be the cause of its form? Itself, only itself. So then it would be swatta siddha, self-existent, unlike all the things that have parts. So, if something were a simplex, that means cannot be divided, and it's what siddha and self-existent, then the self-existent simplex, the atom, is none other than God. Yeah, Paramatma. Because if something has no parts, its form depends on itself. It's self-existent. So when your form depends on your desire, that means your desire is reality. So there's no difference between being a self-existent simplex and being omnipotent. Right? If your desire is reality, you're omnipotent. If that atom is a self-existent simplex, it must be omnipotent because the cause of its existence is only its own desire. And by extension, the cause of everything is also its desire. So that's, that being must be conscious and omnipotent. And because it cannot come apart, it must also be eternal. Hmm? So have you ever heard of something that's eternal, omnipotent, <laughs> omnipresent? <laughs> it starts to sound like a bit like God, right? It's God. So actually nothing, you cannot say anything. You cannot have any sentence which does not imply the existence of a self-existent simplex. And if you analyze it, the self-existent simplex cannot be anything other than God. So, 
In the 12th canto, it said, Vikara kyai mano pi pratyadakmana mantra. You cannot explain anything, even the atom, without reference to God. Because if there were such a thing as a self existent simplex, it must be conscious, all powerful, and eternal. And that's God. You see? But you, ju you just say, well, everything is just atoms. But well, because you didn't analyze it, you know, I don't believe in God because everything's just atoms. Atoms not God. So, <laughs> but, you, but because you're used to dealing with things which are divisible, you never thought what an indivisible thing is like. Hmm? What are the characteristics of something which is indivisible? It must be God. And all indivisible things, they cannot exist without something indivisible. Because dependent existent objects must depend on something that's self-existent. If there weren't something self-existent, then the dependent existent objects could not exist at all. And therefore, it is said that every word implies God. Every word is a reference to God. But due to Vikalpa, we don't understand. Due to non-correlated thought constructs. And this is why after Mahapu received initiation and became enlightened by the mercy of his guru, he came back and he was trying to teach grammar, but all he could say is that all the words are, are about Krishna. All the rules refer to Krishna. Hmm? He hadn't, and, and, and that's what he's gone mad. He hasn't gone mad. Hmm? Everyone else is mad. By <laughs> Raja Goon, everyone else is, and this is the vision that comes automatically when you're free from Vikalpa. But very mostly here in Srimad Bhagavatam, Nargun is breaking it down to us to try to just bring us out logically into the, into the truth. But because we have Rajas in the mind, we can only we may get a glimpse for a moment, then we go back into our bad habit of Vikalpa again. <laughs> so that's why we have to practice sadhana every day and pray for mercy of Guru and Goranga that we can gradually be purified and then that vision will be natural to us. That's it. So now I'm coming to the last verse in this uh, suite of verses. Uh, yes, you can come. Satsa Drisha Brahmastava. Satsa Drisha Brahmastava. Vikalpe Sati Vastuna. Vikalpe Sati Vastuna. Jagrat Swapo Yata Swapne. Jagrat Swapo Yata Swapne. Jata Vidi Nishedata. Satsa Drisha Brahmastavad Vikalpa Sati Vastuna. As long as you are covered by Vikalpa, hmm? sorry, you will be covered by Vikalpa as long as you have a doubt about Vastu, the actual Vastu. Hmm? Since the impression we have of self existent objects all around us cannot possibly or logically be explained in terms of a sangat, an aggregate, or the whole and the parts being one or different from each other, then what is the cause of our mental representation? That is called Aikya Buddhi Alamban Rup. Aikya Buddhi Alamban Rup. We have a mental representation of something being a self-existent whole. What's the cause of that impression? The cause is nothing other than Paramatma Himself. It is He Himself who is everywhere, giving us impression that the things around us are vastu, actually self-existent realities. Hmm? This is why, do you know the Chatusloki Bhagavatam? Second canto, chapter 9 of Srimad Bhagavatam. The four seed verses of Srimad Bhagavatam given by Krishna to Lord Brahma, and from that the whole Bhagavatam came. So you can memorize the whole Bhagavatam in only four verses. So the first one is, Aham meva sameva gre nanyad yad sadasad param Supreme Lord says to Brahma, it's before the creation. Brahma is just there on the lotus flower of Abhadakishai Vishnu and there's nothing. And Supreme Lord, see Krishna is telling him, Aham meva sameva gre, in the beginning, before the creation, there is only me. And afterwards, when all the causes and effects are dissolved. After the destruction, there is only me. And in the middle, there is only me. <laughs> That's the bit that we don't expect. <laughs> Before the creation, when nothing was manifest, there was just me. And afterwards, when it's all over, there's just me. And in the middle, there's just me. <laughs> That's why Hansa Avatar said, you are the witness, and everything else is me. <laughs> this is God. Bhavanam, Janmanam, and Janmanamante. 
Ganavan Mampur, after many births, when we actually get Gana, Vasudeva Samamiti. Sama Atma Sudrulava. Such a great soul is very rare. So there are millions, billions of people in this world, and now you understand this, so you can you can all be that rare person. Hmm? You understand this. So you can just imagine for a moment. Hmm? Close your eyes for a moment. There is just the Pradhan, the unmanifest potential material energy, and the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord, Vishnu, Paramatma, enters into His own energy and causes it to transform and manifests, oh, millions and millions of countless objects. They're all really Him. He has entered into that Pradhan and caused it to transform. He has become the trees, the grass, the flowers, the cars, the cities, the people, the animals, everything. And among those various manifestations, there are so many bodies. They're all His bodies. And right now in this room, there are so many of them. And one of them you're thinking, this, hey, this one's mine, people, leave it alone. <laughs> you can imagine in the city there are so many buildings. And people go to that city and they may enter a building and go up to the to the top floor and then look out from there and say, this is my building and see the other buildings. So in the same way, your soul has entered into one body, which is not you and also not yours, and he's looking out from the top floor called your two eyes at all these other buildings. And in each building, there's another person who went to the top floor looking out and everyone's saying, this is my building. <laughs> but actually the whole thing is the manifestation of Paramatma. The Jeevas have entered into his creation and claiming their rights on different parts of it. Hmm? Open your eyes. Yeah? And now what you're looking at is exactly what I described. <laughs> Stay there. Don't go back. One-way ticket. <laughs> One-way ticket. So, as the Sadhya Sadrisha Brahma, Sadrisha Brahm, Brahm means mistake. And Sadrisha means thinking that the objects of the world are self-independent wholes. That is called Swatantra Sattaya. A multiplicity, a multiplicity, Sattaya means existences in the plural. So Swatantra means independent. Thinking that the world is composed of a multiplicity of independent existences. Huh? That is called Sadrisha Brahm. And Sadrisha also implies that you think that each whole is one thing. But it's not. It's like the flame of a candle. It's never the same thing at any time. But you think it's the same thing. Yeah? I saw you yesterday. Mm -hmm. Right? You're the same per Are you the same person I saw yesterday? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 but in conventional dealings, that's how we deal. So it's okay. Don't, like, meet your friends and say, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen you before. <laughs> No, no. In conventional dealings, we deal in a particular... But we should be aware of conventional dealings. They're the product of Vikalpa and maintain a, a divine consciousness. Mapu said to Raghunath Dasa Swami, Antari Kori Nishta Bhai Lokya Bhyabhaha Internally con uh, cultivate your Nishta, your fixity in devotion to Krishna. Hmm? But outwardly just behave like an ordinary person. Hmm? You go back to your home and don't behave like a madman. <laughs> Crazy fellow. Krami Krami Pai, Baba Loka Singh Pool. Gradually, step by step, you can cross over the ocean of material existence. Uh, so you told him, just cultivate your nishta, stay where you are, behave like an ordinary person, but cultivate. And when your knowledge is mature, Krishna will deliver you from any entanglement and keep you in the holy dharm with pure Mahabhagavat Vaishnavas. Uh, so after some time, Raghunath Swami. He came out of all entanglement and he stayed with Swarab Damodara, Ramanandarai and Mahaprabhu in Jagannath Puri. So, but after he'd come to the stage of Nishta, after that Krishna. So here this verse we're discussing, As long as you have a, a doubt hmm, that what you're seeing around you is only Paramatma in many forms, hmm, then for that, for that long you will be in completely in a state of Vikalpa. So, Jagrat Swapo Yata Sopnei Tata Vidini Shayda Taha. 
The second part of this verse is amazing. Amazing. Hmm? When we are verse to Krishna's service, we also become a verse to Krishna's devotees. Actually. Hmm? When we hear, Krishna said in Srimad Bhagavatam, Acharya mam bijani ham nava manyeti kajit nama chibodhisuyeti sarva deva mayo guru. Hmm? Krishna says, I am the Acharya. Hmm? So the Acharya himself has to sit on the Vyasasan and say, Krishna said, hmm? Acharya, I am the Acharya. Mm -hmm. hmm? And what does it mean? Hmm? Srila Bhaktisiddhan Swatako said, what, should, what can the Acharya do? He cannot escape it. Mm -hmm. If someone will say, no, 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 you shouldn't say that. You're an Acharya and you're saying, you are God. Krishna is saying, the Acharya, I am the Acharya. So you're saying, you are Krishna. So you should not say that. Bhaktisiddhan Swatako said, what should I do? Hmm? Should I rather beat myself over the head with shoes? Mm -hmm and not say what is written in Shastra? Hmm? No, the Acharya has to say, Acharya mam bijaniyam. You are looking at Krishna and Krishna is talking to you and giving you guidance and you cannot disobey. To disobey will be offense to God Himself. Hmm? Cannot be shy. Has to tell the truth. And if someone is averse to Krishna, ah, this is too much. Hmm? Bhaktis Dancer was Thakur said, look at, someone in the audience is thinking, look at him sitting there on a very high Vyasasan with so many garlands and covered in flowers and everyone is bowing down to him. What a wicked, proud person. Huh? The materialistic person will think like this. It's repulsive. It's obnoxious. How can a guru say? Krishna said, Acharyam mam bijaniyam. I am the Acharya. Sakshad haritvena samasta shastre. Yeah. So, we can make it very, very soft and simple. Another thing is, if everybody in the world that you're seeing is actually the Paramatma playing his Sushtilira, Eko Bausham, one has become many, hmm? then why is it that we are under the control of the rules and regulations of Shastra? Because Paramatma is transcendental and he is, it is not necessary for him to follow the, the vidi and the shade, the positive injunctions and to avoid the, the, observe the prohibitions given in Shastra. Paramatma is not controlled by the rules and regulation of the Vedas. So these, if you accept this state of consciousness and become free from Vikalpa, hypothetically, then you might say, oh, well, how can Paramatma be subject to the rules and regulations of Shastra? So here, Narvishi is saying, Jagrat so apoyita sunaita vidini shedata. It is like this. There is a person who is asleep and he's dreaming. But in his dream, he dreams that he was he's awake. And in his dream he goes to bed and he's dreaming. In his dream. And then in his dream, he wakes up from his dream and now he's awake. But he's still in his dream. Right? So a person can be Jagrat Swapo, Yatha Swapne. Just as a person who's actually dreaming, in his dream can sometimes think, I'm awake, I'm, I'm asleep. Hmm? So in the same way, if a person has the Sadrishya Brahm, thinking, not being aware of God everywhere, seeing that all objects are uh, the multiplicity, of the self-existent independent objects and the same in each moment, then if a person has that Sadrishya Brahm, as long as a person has that Sadrishya Brahm, he is subject to the Vidhi and the Shade, the rules and prohibitions of Shastra. And if that soul within that body becomes free from Sadrishya Brahm, free from Vikalpa, now he's no longer under the jurisdiction of rules and regulations of Scripture. Atmaramas chamuneo ne granta apkirukrame kurvanta hoitikim bhaktim itam bhutaganohari. The Atmaramas, self satisfied munis, they're near granta. That means, the granta also means scripture. They're without scripture, that means that they don't have to follow rules and regulations because they're paramahamsas. They're beyond the rules and regulations. So the answer is this no, the body, which is a manifestation of Paramatma, Paramatma is not under rules and regulations. But as long as you are asleep, 
in Sadrsha Brahm, then this body will act in such a way within the creation that if you do something right, you'll progress in Dharma, and if you do something wrong, you'll get a heavy reaction. So the Paramatma plays like this as if he is controlled, as if his forms are controlled by Vidya and Nishade, as long as the soul inside has Sadrsha Brahm, is covered by that Vikalpa. And when that person, that soul within, is free from Sadrsha Brahm, now that body is no longer under the control of within the shade rules and regulations of the Vedas. So it's not absurd or obnoxious to think, Acharyam Mam Vijaniyam, that Sri Guru is the direct manifestation of the Supreme Lord. Why? It is said. Jeeve Sakshat Nahita Te Guru Chaitya Rupe Shiksha Guru Hoye Krishna Mahanta Swarupe Because a conditioned soul has no perception of the Supreme Lord in his heart, the Supreme Lord in his heart comes outside in the form of a Mahant, a great Vaishnav, to give them Shiksha instructions. Hmm? So the meaning is this, that person is in Maya. Actually, everybody around him and everything around him is just the body of the Paramatma. God is already everywhere and in everything. But as long as the souls in those bodies are in the state of Vikalpa and Sadrsha Brahm, then he's acting like, I do this, I get karma, good karma. If I do this, I get bad karma. But when the soul within becomes free from Sadrsha Brahm, now he's not under material energy anymore. And so, actually, Paramatma Supreme Lord was already everywhere. But he's not playing that direct role. And when a soul is free from Sadisha Brahm, now Sakshat Hari. Even for the even for the person who's still under Sadrisha Brahm, this person is directly he can experience as Sakshat Hari, directly form of Supreme Lord. And this is the deep explanation of Guru Tattva. Huh? Okay, who gets it? Some people are nodding. Do you understand? Hmm? So it's it's not that Sri Guru is a proud person who say, I am like God. No. Already everything is like God. But all those forms are acting on the Vidyan, shade and Karma because the, the souls inside of Sadisha Brahm. But if someone is free from Sadisha Brahm, now he's not controlled by that. So he becomes Sakshadhari even for another person who's still in Sadisha Brahm to bring them out. Therefore, Sri Uddhav has said, Naivopayacha patitim kavayastavesha Brahma yusha apikrida ridham mudas marantam Antaba is tanubritam asudam vidunvan Acharya chaitya vapasaswagatim vyanakti It means, O oh my Lord Krishna, the great transcendental poets, they could not express the extent of their gratitude to you. Even in beautiful poetry, even if they glorified you for the life of Lord Brahma, why? Because you are so kind that you appear inside as Paramatma and outside in the form of the Acharya to guide them over all obst obstacles and take them to the transcendental world. So, Antabahis Tanubritam Ashuban Vidunvan, God is in the heart and God appears before us as the Acharya. Acharya Chaitya Vapusa Swagatim Vyanakti. Supreme Lord in the heart and the pure Vaishnava in front of us. No difference. Same person talking. Only the one in the heart we can't hear because we're still in Maya. But we can hear directly from the lips of Sadhguru and pure Vaishnavas. Samsara davan alalida loka tanayakarya ganaganatvam praptasikrayana kunanavasya vande So, now, when a person hears this deeply and they understand something, but then they go back into their material conception of life. Why? It means they are not surrendered. They have not given themselves Atmanivedan. And today is the special day on which we celebrate Atmanivedan. Why? Because it's the appearance day of Lord Vaman Dev. Perhaps you know that Bali Maharaj was killed in a battle with the demigods. But one great Brahmin named Shukracharya brought him back to life. So he felt so indebted to him that he became the disciple of Shukracharya. Under the guidance of Shukracharya, Bali Maharaj performed Vishwajit Yagya 
a sacrifice to conquer the universe. And by this he got so many celestial weapons and he set out with his armies and he was invading heaven. Hmm? Brihaspati told Indra, you can't fight him because he's so powerful now, you cannot defeat him. Why is he powerful? Because he worshipped and served the Brahmanas. This, this is one of the teachings here. Bali Maharaj has become powerful because he worshipped Shukracharya, who is a great Brahman, though he's the guru of all the demons. So, Brihaspati said, Indra, you can't fight him, just run away. Hmm? So Indra and the demigods, they ran away from heaven and Bali Maharaj took over heaven. Then there he did so many Ashvamedha Yagyas and became more and more powerful. Hmm? But in the meantime, Aditi, the wife of the, the mother of Indra and the wife of Kashyapa Rishi was crying. And, she, and her husband was away in the forest doing austerities. And she was at home crying, Oh, my children, my poor children. All the devatas, Indra and the other devas, they're all the children of Aditi. Hmm? They're now suffering so much because they've become homeless. And she was waiting. Finally, her husband came back from the forest. Completely. No Maya at all. His wife said, Oh my dear husband, please help me. My son is suffering. Do something to get his kingdom back. Kasyapa Rishi looked at his wife. And, How powerful is Maya? Hmm? <laughs> who is the son? Who is daughter? Who is brother? Who is father? Who... What are these relate? Because he's coming back from his tapasya, his austerities, his bhajan. How strong is Maya? Huh? She said, Oh, please, my husband, please help me. He said, Don't you know? There are no relationships in this world. Your true husband is Supreme Lord Narayan. Huh? Only he can help you. Please, please do something. So then, Kashyaparish said, All right. And taught her the pie of rat. Pyov rat, the milk rat, fasting for 12 days, only taking milk, and doing a very intense worship of Lord Narayan, following strict vows. He said, if you do this, Lord Narayan will appear as your son and help his elder brothers, the demigods. <laughs> Not really brothers, but see, Baman Devi is called Indranuja, the younger brother of Indra, in a conventional sense. So, so then she followed this brat. And then, after completing the brat, the Supreme Lord appeared in the heart of Kashyapa. And then from the heart of Kashyapa came to the womb of the uh, Aditi, and then tsh, manifested outwardly. As a very beautiful young Brahmin boy, all the demigods worshipped him. The sun god came and gave him Upanayan Sanskar. Om Bhur Bhur and did his Upanayan Sanskar. And other demigods came and gave him various Danda and Kamandalu and Deerskin, all the paraphernalia of a Brahmachari. And there was little Vamandei, very, very beautiful, beautiful. And then he set off and he went to, on the bank of the Namada river, Bali Maharaj was performing a Yagya. And the Yagya was going on, going on, and at some point in a break in the Yagya, Lord Vamandev came into the assembly of, mm, of uh, Bali Maharaj. And he was shining like the sun, all thought, who is this effulgent personality? And they gave respect to him as a Brahmin. So then Bali Maharaj, I'm just telling in brief, Bali Maharaj is a king. So a king has an ego that they have to give charity to Brahmanas. This is how the king, that's how he became powerful and conquered heaven. So he said, oh Brahmana, you can request from me whatever you like. Lord Vamandev said, please give me just three steps of land by the measurement of my own steps. So then Bali Maharaj thought, his feet are so small. <laughs> this is a very small piece of land. He said, you're, you're, because you're a child, your intelligence has not developed. You don't know about your own self-interest. <laughs> A person who comes and asks charity from me should never have to ask for anything from anyone ever again. So you ask for you, I can give you a whole country. I can give you 50 Brahmin, young Brahmin girls to marry. I can give you gold, cows, horses, everything. 
Mm-hmm. Just ask. Lord Vaman Dev said, a person who is not satisfied with what comes by its own accord can never be happy even if they take control of the whole world. Mm-hmm. The satisfaction is the quality of a Brahman. And a Brahman who is satisfied with what comes easily of its own accord, his power increases every day. And if a Brahman is dissatisfied with his lot in life, then his powers diminish every day. So please, just make a vow, promise that you'll give me three steps of land. So then, Bali Maharaj, he agreed. So before giving a donation, you have to make a sankalpa. So he took his Achaman cup, hmm? took his Achaman cup to make the sankalpa, to put water in his hand. At that time, Shukracharya came to him and said, Your Majesty, don't do this, don't it's do a trick. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a little Brahmin boy, it's actually Bhagavan. It's Lord Vishnu himself. He's come on the side of the demigods and he'll trick you, he'll take everything from you. So then, Bhagavan has thought, it's a supreme rule. Surely, I should do Atmani Vedan. I should surrender everything. I should disobey my guru, yeah. even. Because if one should never give up his guru, ever. But if guru goes against the Bhagavan and Bhakti and Bhaktas, the devotees, the Shastra, the Supreme Lord, and the path of devotional service, then should be given up at once. Jinke Priya Narama Videhi Chadu Koti Vairi Sam Yadyapi Paramasanehi. Tosidas Ji has said that, oh, because he's a devotee of Lord Ram, he said, if someone has no love for Lord Ram, then you should give that person up. Even if they have lots of affection for you, give them up as if they were 10 million deadly enemies. Hmm? Chajo Pita Pralada Vibhishana Bando Bharatmahatari Guru Bhal Chajo Kanta Bharatvanita Bhayajaka Mangalakari But Shastra says, you should not give up your father. No, Pralad Maharaj gave up his father because he was against Krishna. Chajo Pita Pralada Vibhishana Don't give up your elder brother. No, Vibhishana gave up Ravan. Bando Bharatmahatari Don't give up your mother. No, Bharat Maharaj gave up. He said, I'll never use this word mother again in reference to her because she made Sita and Ram go to the forest in exile. Hmm? So Bharat gave up Kaike. Hmm? Guru Bali Chajo Kanta Brajabanita. Bali Maharaj gave up his guru. Hmm? Kanta Brajabanita and the gopis of Vrindavan, they gave up their husband. Bayaj- and was it inauspicious? Bayajagamangalakari. No, it made auspiciousness for the whole world. Hmm? So then he, he thought, no, my guru is going against Krishna. So I should not follow him. So then he went to do, he took the, the Achaman cup to do the Sankalpa. And then Shukachara said, I have to stop him. So Shukachara, by his mystic powers, he took the form of a fly. And, and he flew into the spout of the Achaman cup. So when he was trying to pour out some water, he wouldn't come. <laughs> so Shankachara was inside the spout of his Achaman cup. And he was looking through the hole. <laughs> like you see, what's going on? Hmm? So Lord Vamandev, he said, uh, don't worry. And he took a piece of straw and he took the Achiman cup. He said, I'll just clear, clean the spout. And poked out the eye of Shankar, Shukracharya oh with a piece of straw. That's why Shukracharya only has one eye. <laughs> that means the Vedas discuss the worldly life how to fulfill material desires, but also the ultimate purpose of life, the spiritual goal of life. But Shukutra has only one eye, he only sees the material portion. Mm-hmm. The Vedas are actually only to know me, Krishna said. But in the Gita, Krishna has also said, Trigunya Visha Veda, Nishtrigunya Hey Arjun, the Vedas deal with the three gunas. You have to give up these three gunas. So there's you can interpret the Vedas from the material perspective or from the spiritual perspective. But Chankachara, Sukrachara, sorry, has only one eye. Shukra, Shukra means semen. That means seminal Acharya. Huh? I am Guru because my father was Guru, his Guru. It's all Shukra Acharya. Seminal Guru, not actually by qualification. So, now Shukrachara has one eye and the, the spout of the Achiman cup is clear and then he 
Om Keshoi Namah, Om Narayana, Om Madhavai Namah. And he took the Sankalp and made a vow. I'll give you three steps of land. So then, with his first step, he covered the earth and all the lower planets. And with the second step, he covered the, all the upper planets. There was nothing left. <laughs> hmm? he, then, Lord Vamandev said, Oh, Vali Maharaj, you promised me three steps. Hmm? So, this is very, very fascinating. That he covered the whole universe. It's not really that he covered the whole universe. He was already the whole universe. Only Balimaraj saw it. <laughs> you understand? In Bhagavatam it said, He saw that the rivers were the veins of Vamandev. That the trees and herbs were the hairs on the body of Vamandev. That the stones and rocks were the nails of Vamandev. Hmm? That the Brahmanas and Rishis were his head. The sudras were his legs, like this. So he saw. Actually, it was not, um, but that's actually the truth. So in other words, the uh, truth of reality was revealed to him by the two steps of Vaman Dev. Then Vaman Dev said, you promised me three steps. <laughs> then Bali Maharaj said, oh, you can place your third step upon my head. And he bowed down. Hmm? And Lord Vaman Dev put his foot on the head of Bali Maharaj. <laughs> this is Atmani Vedanam. So, I am saying this because what we have discussed about being free from Vikalpa and free from Sadrisha Brahm, hmm? that vision, hmm? don't go back. Hmm? But you can only stay there by what? Atmani Vedanam. Atmani Vedanam. Hmm. There are two types of Atmani Vedanam described in Shastra. Hmm? One is called Deya Arpanam. Deha Arpanam, Deha Arpanam, offering the body. It is exactly like a cow. There was a farmer, he took a cow to the marketplace and sold to another farmer. Now, this cow belongs to that other farmer. And everything it does, its milk and calves, everything belongs to that farmer. So in the same way, when we come to Sri Guru, Diksha Kali Bhakta Kari Atma Samarpan, Say Kali Kari Tari, Say Kali Krishna Kari Tari Atma Sam, at the time of Diksha, the disciple does Atmani Vedan, like Bali Maharaj. Nothing is mine, everything is yours. You are everything and you are everywhere, and everything is yours, including me. I, there I have no independence. Hmm? Just like the cow who is sold. Now I am the sold out animal. I am sold to you. I belong to you. And everything that I do is yours. Hmm? So this is called Dayarpanam, offering the body like the cow is now the property of the new farmer. Now we become the property of Guru. That means by extension, that means of Krishna. Because Dikshu Kali Bhakta Kari Atma Samarpan. At the time of Dikshu, when the disciple does Atma Samarpan, Atma Nivedanam, then hmm, Krishna Kari Tari Atma Sam, Krishna accepts him as his own family member. Say Deya Kari Tari Chidananda Moy, Aprakrita Deya Tara Charna Bajai. Krishna makes his body transcendental, and in that transcendental body, he serves Krishna's lotus feet. This is the meaning of Diksha. Hmm? So one type of Atmani Veda is Dayarpan, and the other one is called Chaitra Gyarpan. Chaitra Gyarpan. Chaitra means the field, and Gya means the knower of the field. So offering the knower of the field. Chaitra Gyarpan. Hmm? That means this. Let's say you are just uh, going about your daily life, whatever you do. You're a postman, or a nurse, or a teacher, or a truck driver, or a professor, or whatever. Hmm? But as your body is going through all the emotions of daily life, you remain in the state of Ketragya. I am the witness of the field of the body. Hmm? And that I, I have offered to you. So one could think, uh, Srila Bhaktinoda Thakur, he was a high court magistrate. You know, he had a job. He was married. He had 13 children. How is he surrendered? You know? But just, you cannot tell from what someone is doing. They can offer the I, the self, as the witness. That self who is the Ketargya. What I am seeing is one thing, but myself, I am giving. Completely. So these are the two types of Atmini Vedan. 
day arpana, offering the body, if you just offer your body, but you are not in shakshitwa, in the state of shakshitwa, witnesshood, then you haven't really given yourself. Hmm? You, then you think, I'm doing this stuff for Gurudev. Hmm? How generous I am. Hmm. I, I, I. Huh? Because the eye is there. Huh? You've given everything, and you're doing everything, but you haven't given the eye. Hmm? So, the full Atmanivedanam is both. Deya Arpanam and Ketra Dhyapanam. Both. Full. Aham Mamasti Yapkin Chit. Iha Loke Paratracha. Tatsarabam Babato Nata. Charneshu Samapitam. If you're a Pujari, then you know this verse because you have to, at the end of the Puja, you have to say, Oh my Lord, whatever is I, whatever is called I, and whatever is called mine, in this life and in future lives, hmm? all of that I offer completely at your lotus feet. Hmm? Right? Hmm? You can ask Krishna too. She is a Pujari. So, uh, this is Atmanivedan. Now, this full Atmanivedan also has two types. Bhava Bina and Bhav Vaishistya. Surrender without any particular mood. Oh my Lord, I am a soul, I am part and parcel of you, I surrender to you. And ba that is called Bhav Bina, without a special mood. And Bhav Vaishistya. Surrendering with a particular mood. Huh? So the example of surrendering without any particular mood is Matyo Yada Chakta Samasta Kama Nivedi Tatma Vichitesha Tome Tadamrita Atvam Patipadyamana Mamatma Buyaya Chakalpate Vai. Mapu taught this verse to Sunatan Goswami when he wanted to, Sunat Goswami wanted to kill himself because of the infections in his skin the disease that he had and Mapu was embracing him and the blood was coming on Mapu's body he felt very embarrassed but Mapu saying no no hmm? your body is transcendental why? Diksha Kale Bhaktikara you have surrendered yourself and Krishna has made your body transcendental then he quoted this verse of Srimad Bhagavatam hmm? Matyo when a mortal being Yada Chakta Samastra Karma gives up all reward seeking activities Self-centered reward-seeking activities, nivedi tatma, and offers himself, which he told me. Then Krishna says, "I, I desire to make him special. Tadamrita tuam, I make his body amrita, transcendental. Mamatma buyaya chakalpateva, he becomes like me, in my same level, and he comes to me. So this verse is an example of." Bhav Vina, it's just speaking about Atmani Vedan, but without specifying any Bhav. And Bhav Vaishishta, the example is Rukmini. When Rukmini was about to be married to Shishapal, she wrote a letter to Krishna to come and rescue her. And she wrote, Oh my Supreme Lord Krishna, I have surrendered myself fully to you. Please come accept me as your wife. So there's a Sambandha in there. So we should do Atmani Vedan today. Following the example of Bali Maharaj, hmm? it's exactly the same thing. He saw the Supreme Lord was everything and realized all belongs to him. There's, I have no independence, I am your servant. Hmm? And so he did Atmani Veda. So as you are hearing the teaching of Narad Muni to Yudhisthir March today, that removes all Vikalpa, and you see the reality, you have to remain there. There's no difference between the experience of Bali Maharaj and our experience today. This is the real way to celebrate Bama Naduadesi. We don't celebrate it by just hearing the glories of Bali Maharaj and Bama Dev. We celebrate it by following in the footsteps of Bali Maharaj. By taking his mood of complete Atmani Veda. But we should do it Bhavaishisht with a particular mood. So at the time of Diksha, Gurudev gives mantra and Sambandha Gyan. If you have received Diksha but not Sambandha Gyan and Shiksha in mantra, then you should. You can approach a Shiksha Guru and then understand what is your Sambandha. And then all your hearing, chanting and remembering should be absorbed. Your surrender should be Babishishta with one deep relationship. Especially we follow Rupa Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami. Mm. So, uh -huh. where were we? Yes. 
Vamandev just put his lotus foot on the head of Bali Maharaj. And then he said, you promised me another step. This is, this is not another step of land because I took the whole universe and you were in the universe. <laughs> so you've broken your promise. Just because I put my foot on your head doesn't mean you've given me a third step. So I must punish you. At once Garuda came there with the ropes of Varun and bound up. Now Bali Maharaj, he surrendered everything. And what did Lord Bamandev do? Had him tied up. Then Bali Maharaj's assistants, they're all demons. So they, what is this? And they all attacked Lord Vamandev. So as soon as all the uh, demons ran forward with their weapons to try to kill Lord Vamandev, then Lord Vamandev's all associates from Vaikuntha appeared there. Jai and Vijay came with their weapons and they were killing all the demons. Bali Maharaj, he was all tied up. He said, stop, stop, just stop fighting. <laughs> Please, can't we just all get along? <laughs> So then the fighting stopped. Now one may say, this is Bali Maharaj, he's the grandson of Prahlad Maharaj. Right? So Jai and Vijay became Hirani Kashapur and Hiran Yaksha at the time of his uh, Bali Maharaj's uh, grandfather. And then they yet to come as uh, the Kumbhakarna and Shishupal in Krishna Lila. So how could they appear there and, 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 and fight off the demons to protect because he doesn't need anyone to protect him, but they, he must be given that service of protecting him. How is it possible? And the truth of the matter is that Jain Vijay never fell to the material world. They were always there, but they expanded themselves only to do this pastime. Mm -hmm. hmm? How can the Supreme Lord's associates ever leave him? It's impossible. Yadgadvana Nivatante Tadava Parmam Mama. So the, re the original Jain Vijay came there and they were in the Lila. And their expansions were going through these three births. Mm. As the Hirani Kashpu here and actually Ravan Kumbhakarna and Shishu, uh, Shishupal and Tantavaka. So <clears throat> they came and then they stopped fighting. Then all the demigods came and they were showering flowers on, on Bali Maharaj and on Lord Vamandev. How wonderful we are seeing this example of Atmani Vedanam. Hmm? That he, he surrendered to the Supreme Lord and the Supreme Lord has punished him like a criminal and said, I am sending you down, down to the lower planets, to Sutal planetary system. Hmm? So Brahman, all the demigods began to pray. Oh, this is so wonderful. Because even though he surrendered, but Krishna punished him and he did not try to um, complain. He did not object. He accepted everything that the Supreme Lord arranged. Hmm? And this was to show the glories of love to the whole world. Hmm? Because you can, oh my Lord, I'm suffering so much, I'll surrender to you. And then Krishna saves you. And then the next moment, Krishna puts you in more suffering than before. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, oh, well, I'm going to go back to my material life. <laughs> huh? So this is not really surrender. Surrender is with a one-way ticket. So Bali Maharaj surrendered. And then he was punished and bound up like a criminal and sent down to the lower planetary system to show that the Supreme Lord is like this. Sometimes he puts his devotee into difficulties, but the devotee is oh, very happy. Just like Kunti Devi. Vipada Santu Yasat Sat Tata Tata Jigat Guru. Naiva Hattabidata, right? Is she saying, Oh my Lord? Now the war, battle of Kurukshetra is over. My son has become the emperor of the world. Hmm? Everything's nice now. And now you're going, you're leaving us and going back to Dwarka. Please, Krishna, give us more problems. <laughs> because when we have problems at that time, we think of you and we see you. And by seeing you, we'll never see the repeated cycle of birth and death. Hmm? So the, in the materialist is always trying to get out of trouble and out of problems. And God, please help me. Hmm? But the devotee is saying, bring more problems. They, with open arms, they're welcoming more and more problems. Hmm? This is the difference. For the devotee, problems are, are like uh, the prey. The devotee's love is like a lion. And just when a lion fights with the elephant, kills him and eats him and becomes strong. So in the same way, when there's love, problems are not problems, just more food. <laughs> <laughs> just makes your love stronger, nourishes the love even more. So, Bali Maharaj, he was pushed down to the lower planetary system, Sutal. But actually, Vishvakarma had made Sutal more beautiful than heaven. 
It was higher than heaven. And Lord Vamandev said, he will reign there for a long time. And then when it comes to the Savarni Manvantar period, then he'll become the king of heaven. And after the uh, Savarni Manvantar period, then he'll come to me in Vaikuntha. So it wasn't really a punishment. And also, Lord Vamandev was bound by the ropes of the love of Bali Maharaj. And he became his doorman and he lived there with him in the Sutali planetary system. Visrajati Ridayam Nayasya Sakshad Hari Ravaso Bitopya Goganasha Pranaya Rasayana Titangri Padma Sabavati Bhagavata Bardana Uptaha. The Supreme Lord cannot leave the heart of his devotee for a moment. Even though the Lord is so powerful that if a person with bad karma, in danger, about to die, just by accident, calls out, Krishna! Then he gets saved from everything, even he becomes liberated and attains liberation. The Supreme Lord is so powerful. But that powerful Supreme Lord himself becomes bound up by the love of his devotee and can never leave him. So though Lord Vamandev bound up Bali Maharaj with the snakes, but Bali Maharaj bound up Lord Vamandev with the ropes of love, and now he has to stay with him as his security guard in Sukhdal Planet. <laughs> hmm? More beautiful than heaven. Just like Krishna gave Sudama Brahmin. You know, Sudama Brahmin lived in like the shack. Mm -hmm. You know, like just terrible, just broken down hut. But when he, after seeing Krishna, when he went back, Krishna manifested a beautiful palace. So just as that palace was manifest for Sudama Brahmin, so beautiful palace, the whole Sutta plant system became beautiful. Hmm? So he went down there. So now Bali Maharaj has gone down to Sutta, and uh, Shukrachar is still standing there, and remember, they're in the middle of a yajna. Hmm. So then Supreme Lord Bamandev said to Shukracharya, Oh, I have disturbed the proceedings of the yajna, you know, coming here, taking the whole universe. There was a big fight between my associates and the demons. So the Yagya has been somewhat disturbed. So please perform the rituals to remove the obstacles from the Yagya and complete this Yagya. And it will be perfected just by the glance of the Brahmanas. So Lord Vamandev spoke very politely and beautifully to Shukracharya. Then Shukracharya, he, he said, Oh my Lord, Mantratas Tantratas Chidyam Deshikalata vastu, vastu Vastutaha Sarvam Karoti Nischidram Anusankirtamang Tava This is the conclusion of this pastime. He said, Oh my Lord, if there's some discrepancy in the mantra and the tantra, the mantras and the procedures of this sacrifice, if there's some discrepancy, Deshikala Vastuda in the purity of the substances in the place or in the time. Then Sarvam Karoti Nistrijam Nischidram. All the faults are removed at once. How? Anu Sankirtanam Tava. Just by continuous Harinam Sankirtan. Tabuvana Mangukari Sri Harinam Sankirtan Yaki. So this is the conclusion of this Lila. If there's a problem in your life, don't see it as a problem. See it as a provocation of Supreme Lord who is everywhere. Testing your devotion, testing your love, testing your surrender. And this is a chance to capture his heart and tie him up with the rope of love. So no problems at all in life. Try to have a mood like Bali Maharaj, seeing Supreme Lord everywhere and don't go back. Dei Harpana, Ketragya Arpana. Hmm? Your sense of I and mine, everything, offered to the Supreme Lord, and then engage continuously in Harinam Sankirtan, and your life will be perfect. Shila Jiva Goswami Pada Ki Jai Lord Vamandev Abhibhav Titi Mahamotsala Ki Jai Lord Maharaj Ki Jai Mani Vedana Ki Jai Bhuvna Mangkari Sri Harinam Sankirtana Ki Jai Bale Vrindavan Vyarlala Ki Jai Vrindavan Sanivari Ki Jai Vrishubhanu Raj Kumari Ju Ki Jai 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 Sri Rai